the Encyclopedia Britannica was first published as a three-volume set from 1768 to 1771. It's been the gold standard in the uh, past 250 years for all of encyclopedias because it went online, <clears throat> exclusively online in March of 2012. It's no longer available in print. But there was a time when having a set of uh, Encyclopedia Britannicus in a person's home was like having a computer. I mean, all of the, it, it just seemed like all of the world's information was right there in that set of books. I mean, I don't know if any of you experienced this, but it was like a trophy in your home, kind of like a moose head is a trophy to a hunter, you know? I mean, I still remember when my parents told my brother and sister and I, we were probably in middle school, that they had purchased a set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, purchasing these bad boys wasn't an inexpensive proposition, and I knew they didn't have much money, but, but it was like, like our parents were putting a flag there on the moon, and they said, you know what? We want our children to excel intellectually. <laughs> I know, it worked, right? It worked. In the 250 years since it was first published, very few people have actually read uh, the entire set from A to Z. 32 volumes at 200 words per minute, which is the average reading speed for an adult. It would take approximately 153 days to read through the 44 million words in a nine point font found on 33,000 tissue thin pages spread over 32 volumes. And that's only if 153 days you never stop to sleep, eat or go to the bathroom. A.J. Jacobs read through the entire set, and then he published a book in the year 2004 entitled The Know-It-All, One Man's Humble Quest to Become the Smartest Person in the World. In his book, Jacobs shares samples of the information that he read in the encyclopedias, as well as some of the lessons he, he learned. Many people have used some form of the quote, knowledge is power. Every team that wants to win has to have a playbook. Every musical instrument has a set of instructions for learning how to play it. Every machine has a manual on how to run it. Last week, David Chase kicked off a series of, of sermons that we are going to have here at New Hope entitled, Ready, Set, Grow like putting furniture or a jigsaw puzzle or a bicycle together. Some spiritual assembly is required in our character if we are to successfully do life here on earth as well as enjoy life in the hereafter. And how we can best do that is the focus of our messages over the next few weeks. So let's start here by um, reading Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 13. <clears throat> For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. The word of God exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. Here's my prayer, that today's message will, will compel each of us to find some kind of a Bible plan and read through it consistently this year. Why does the Word of God have such an important role in our spiritual growth? If you'll take out your outlines there on the inside of your bulletins, the first is this, we all need instructions. I baked a cake last night. Um, didn't use any recipe card. Didn't uh, use any instructions from my wife. And I know some of you might think, well, that's a recipe for disaster. Well, listen, Gordon Cook and I were the first 
boys to break that glass ceiling by taking a home economics class at Wayne High School many years ago. So I have some experience with this, okay? So last night, there I am, just going from memory, and I don't know, um, I mixed three cups of flour, one half cup of sugar, two eggs, one and a half cups of water, pinch of salt, tablespoon of vanilla extract, and, and some blueberries, okay? And then I preheated the oven, baked this uh, cake for 20 minutes. Uh, for $15, you can have a sample of this bad boy here after the... <laughs> And when the thing was done, there it is, that is not mold, those are the blueberries there. It's right here, okay? When it was done, my grandson uh, took a bite and asked permission to spit it into the sink. And I thought I heard him use the word nasty. Um, <laughs> we men are notorious for thinking we don't need instructions. Am I right, guys? The kids get a new toy for Christmas. I don't need the instructions. I'm a man, right? Put some furniture together, what, what, a bicycle, whatever it is, and it's not until we see some parts missing, or they're still there. You know, where do these go that we humbly decide we're going to look at the instructions to see where these missing pieces go. If we want to do anything right in life, we would all be wise to find the set of instructions and follow them. And in today's world of technology, man, we can download apps to our phones and other electronic devices. We can go to YouTube and, and check out there, you know, anything from your, your own do-it-yourself project to uh, getting physically fit, learning a new language. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. Life, life also has a set of instructions. In Proverbs 4 and verse 13, God reminds us, take hold of my instructions. Don't let them go. Guard my instructions. Hold on to them. Put them into practice for my instructions are the key to life. Left to ourselves, without instructions from God, we human beings demonstrate an amazing ability to mess up our lives. During the period of the judges in the Old Testament, God's people often tried to do life without God. And Judges 17.6 summarizes this time in history with these words. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Everyone did what they wanted to do. Everyone did what they thought was best for themselves and best for others. And as we read through the book of Judges, my goodness, it is a lesson on how morally messed up we can be when we try to do life without God. The people of Noah's day, they didn't think they needed instructions from God either. And as a result, the Bible says, now the Lord observed the extent of the people's wickedness, and he saw that all of their thoughts were consistently, they were totally evil. I mean, it was so bad. God eventually destroyed mankind and everything else on earth with a flood. I'm just saying that like a cake that is baked without instructions, life doesn't work without God. The psalmist writes, because of his pride, there is no room for God in the wicked man's life. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And then that fool royally messes up his or her life because he or she thinks they are smarter than God. As Solomon says, the purpose of God's instructions 
is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right and just and fair. I mean, we've all figured it out. There are, there are great consequences in life when we make right decisions. And there are bad consequences when we make wrong decisions. Unfortunately, when we make bad decisions, many times not only are we the ones that suffer, but so do those whom we love around us suffer with us. So if we all need instructions at many and various times in our lives, whose instructions are we going to listen to? Our own or God's? Can we get to the point in our lives where we can admit that we are not the all-knowing person we think we are, that we are in need of help, or are we stubbornly going to go through life doing the same things we've always done, getting the same stupid results? So we all need instructions. But you know what? More than that, we all need biblical instructions. Now, I told you about A.J. Jacobs, who, who read through the entire Encyclopedia Britannica about 15 years ago. All 44 million words, 33,000 pages, 32 volumes uh, that he did that. Does that make him the smartest person in the world? No. Nah. Do you suppose he is smarter than the average person who hasn't read the entire Encyclopedia Britannica? Probably so. Would A.J. Jacobs be even more intelligent if he read through the entire set of Encyclopedia Britannica more than once? Pretty sure he would be. I did some reading on this guy. He sees his life as a series of experiments. He does kind of wacky things. He once hired some individuals to do every aspect of his life for a month while he just kicked back and did some reading and watched television. And, and these individuals, I think he said they were from India, these individuals read to his children at night, argued with his wife, uh, checked his emails for him, and et cetera, et cetera. Another experiment he tried for one month was he was totally honest with people. I mean, when they asked him something, well, no, I don't like your dress, you know, or whatever the case might be. Jacobs grew up with no religion at all. In his words, he says, I'm Jewish, but in the same way that Olive Garden is Italian. Not very. But, he said, I'm interested in religion. So Jacobs read through the Bible using several different versions, and he wrote down what he found were about 700 rules that the Bible says that we are to live by, ranging all the way from the Ten Commandments that we're familiar with to uh, one, one uh, command in Leviticus which tells men not to shave our beards to the corner. He said that was kind of neat, figuring out what the corner was. But Jacobs then decided that he was going to live by these rules, even though he wasn't a, necessarily a religious man. He was gonna live by these rules for an entire year, and he wrote a book about his experiences. About all, out of all the various experiments in his life, A.J. Jacobs says, and I'm quoting him here, perhaps my most profound and life-changing experience was living my life biblically for one year. And while he still sees himself as an agnostic, now after having completed that, he calls himself a reverent agnostic. And, and while he still denies that there is a God who created anything, he admits that a lot of these biblical principles make sense. For instance, he said, and I'm quoting, one of the great things about my year was doing the Sabbath. Because I am a workaholic, having this one day where you cannot work really changed my life. And while he's still far from being a Christian, I just can't help but wonder. If he was to read through the Bible again, I just wonder if he might be so impacted by the Bible, living out its truths for, a, for a, another year, if that wouldn't 
bring him even closer to God. As a matter of fact, what might happen in our lives if we daily, consistently spent time in God's word and then lived out the things that we learned? The Hebrew author says in our text, the word of God is living, it is It is active. It is powerful. And why is that? Because God sees everything about us. He sees where we go. He sees everything we do. He knows everything we think. He knows everything we desire. And consequently, because he knows us so well, God inspired men to write truths that that impact and affect every human being, regardless of what time in history that they might be alive. God's word exposes us for who we are because the word of God comes from God. The Bible's not just a collection of Wikipedia-like stories that have been gathered and written by human beings. No prophecy in scripture came from the prophets themselves. It was the Holy Spirit who moved the prophets to speak from God. You see, all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching us what is true and for making us realize what is wrong. The Bible has answers and for any situation that we have in life, any experience, whether it's the husband-wife relationship, whether it's the employer-employee relationship, a parent-child relationship, whether it has to do with our pride or our humility, whether it has to do with practicing hospitality or, or practicing forgiveness, whether it has to do with owning land or paying taxes or, or knowing how to save our money or how to spend our money, whether it has to do with government, all of it was written by men who were inspired by God. These truths found within Scripture come from the very mind of God, and as such, they are divine. They are eternal. But what good is divine information if we aren't reading it, if we aren't studying it, if we aren't obeying it and putting it into practice? In, in the Jewish culture of Jesus' day, a bridegroom would go to the parents' house of his bride, and, and there they would have the wedding ceremony. And then they, the, the bride and groom and their families and their guests would have a procession, and they would go to the groom's house where they would celebrate. I mean, it could last a, a whole week of eating and, and celebrating. And so in in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells this parable about these 10 ladies who were, were, they they weren't at the wedding ceremony, but they wanted to get into the the wedding procession as it was going from the bride's house to the the groom's house for the celebration. And, And they had lamps, it was at night, and they had lamps. Now, five of these ladies anticipated you know, just in case uh, the wedding procession is late, they, they had extra oil for their lamps. You know, you ever had that just in case? Things don't always go the way that we think they are. And so five of the ladies had a contingency plan. They had already purchased extra oil. The other five didn't. And so as the night goes on, and five are running out of oil in their lamps. You know, what do we do? Do we, do we stay? Do we risk going to purchase some more oil? That The procession goes by. Well, they did. They went and bought some more oil. And while they were gone, the wedding procession comes by. The five who were prepared got in, in line, went to the, the feast. And the other five missed out. Because when they got to the, the celebration, the door was shut. Nobody was allowed who was late. Five were prepared, five weren't. Sometimes 
for all of us as we go through life, calamity nails us. And in that moment, we have to choose how we're going to respond. It's too late. It's too late when it happens to prepare for it. A choice has to be made. And that choice will be made based upon the preparation that we've made before that. Other times, opportunity comes and we got to choose between sometimes two good options. And a wise decision in that moment is going to be dependent upon the wisdom and the instruction that we've accumulated prior to that moment. Sometimes as we go through life, temptation grips us to purchase something that we know we can't afford, but we want it anyway. To watch something on television that we shouldn't be watching. Or to do something that we shouldn't be doing. And once again, the choice we make will be dependent upon how we prepared ahead of that time in the Word of God. And it will determine whether we make the right choice or not. I'm just saying time to prepare for any major decision is not when the decision confronts us. The famous French chemist Louis Pasteur once wrote, chance favors those who were prepared. Benjamin Franklin once said, if we fail to plan, we're planning to fail. If I say to you this morning, a, B, C, D. Would you fill in the, la- the next three blanks? E, F, G. Now listen. It's not like all of you have spent the last two or three weeks preparing your alphabet, have you? We got that when we were young. Did we not? We learned those things when we were young. And it's amazing how, much th- how many things we... We remember when we are young, right? Young minds remember much better than older minds, which is one of the reasons it's so important to, to memorize God's word when we're younger. Why, why that's such an integral part of our children's programming at, at New Hope? Because the fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. A guy named Jerry taught four and five year olds in Sunday school for over 30 years. And every Sunday he began class in the same way. Kids, we're going to have a lesson now. Where does our lesson come from? And the children would all reply together, the Bible. And Jerry would ask, well, what does that mean? And with one voice they would enthusiastically reply, we know it's true every week. Do you think the kids that went through Jerry's four- and five-year-old class received a foundation for a solid biblical worldview? I think they probably did. Jeremiah wrote, When I discovered your words, I devoured them. King David wrote, Taste and see that the Lord is good. How often are we feeding on the Word of God? Are we devouring the Word of God? Because I'm pretty sure of this, that when we do, no matter what we go through in life, we will be able to see that God is good. And only then will we be able to trust in the Lord with all of our heart acknowledging that his ways are the right ways and our ways are not. So not only do all of us need a set of instructions when we go through life and not only must those set of instructions be biblical in nature, but folks, there is a reward 
There really is for following biblical instructions. Before Joshua led the people of God into the promised land, after they'd been gone and absent for 440 plus years, the Lord himself reminded Joshua, be careful to obey all the instructions, not some, not many, but all of the instructions Moses gave you. Meditate on these words day and night so you will be sure to obey everything that is written in it. Only then, only then, when you meditate on these words day and night, when you obey them, only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. I'm telling you, that is just as relevant for us as it was for Joshua. King David wrote in Psalms, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn. Jesus said that a wise person prepares for the trials and the problems and the tests that we all know we're going to face. A wise person, Jesus said, prepares for that, those trials by knowing God's word and obeying God's word and building their lives on a solid foundation that will stand any storm we face in life. Brittany D. Lamora describes her childhood with these words, and I quote. She says, I grew up in a broken home, so I really didn't know my value or my worth. She was discovered at the age of 18 and spent nearly 10 years of her life making pornographic movies. in order to deal with her conscience, which bothered her. Brittany abused cocaine, heroin, a variety of other drugs. After three years in this industry, she started attending church with her grandfather. And while there, she she found a guy named Jesus. who loved her unselfishly, loved her unconditionally. Now is a case oftentimes when we come to find Jesus and know Jesus and even turn our lives over to Jesus, she still struggled with that lifestyle for a few years, but she began reading the Bible and as she, as she read the Bible, she saw the truths about God. It conflicted with some of her own experiences and some of the things that she had been taught. So one day as she's headed to Las Vegas to make another pornographic film, she takes her Bible with her on the airplane and she's reading it. And Brittany says she felt God saying to her, Brittany, this isn't the life that I have for you. I have something so much greater in store for you, but I need you to give me a step of faith today. I need you to quit this industry right now, and I promise you, your life will turn around. That was in December of 2012. Brittany's never looked back. In fact, she's married to a pastor. And Brittany tells people today, and I quote, the affirmation you are looking for is in God. He will fulfill your heart's desire. He will fill the longing of your soul. He will heal your broken heart and no amount of money can buy that. I'm just saying, what was true for Brittany is true for any one of us who turns to God and reads his word. The Beta Hunt gold mine in Australia recently produced what its owner believes are two of the biggest gold specimens in human history. The uh, first and the largest of the two stones weighed 198 pounds with an estimated 143 pounds of gold 
at current prices uh, estimated to be worth $2.6 million one stone. The second largest, biggest rock weighed 132 pounds and was valued at about $1.95 million. And in fact, the, the total take in this particular area of this mine is estimated to be worth more than $10.4 million. Now, you know what's funny about this? They've been digging in this mine for 45 years and continually found gold here and there. And, and yet, they're still getting it. They're still getting gold. In fact, the largest amount ever recorded anywhere. And that's the way it is with the Word of God. We, we can dig in its truths for years and years and still not seen it all. We can open it up and find treasure for us that day and, and the next day and the next month. And you know what? No matter how many times we come and dig and look, there's, there's still more gold to be found. That's because the Lord's promises are pure. Like silver refined in a furnace and gold purified seven times over. I don't want anybody here to go through this year, 2019, without a commitment to daily, consistently read God's Word. I don't care if you just start with one chapter a day. Or maybe your commitment is to read through the whole New Testament this year. Some of you I know are committed to read through the whole Bible this year. Whatever it is, find a plan, a Bible reading plan, and stick to it. Because there's good stuff in here. There's gold. And it works. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. It works. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who, who leads us to truths we, we, we'd read before and we just didn't see how powerful they were and time after time, God. And thank you for calling us here this morning. It's not an accident. It's not an accident we're here today because you wanted to speak to us. And I pray we wouldn't just be dependent upon what takes place here for you to speak to us, but God, we give you that opportunity every day. So in advance, I just want to say thanks. Thanks for what you've done and what you are doing, and thanks in advance for what you're going to do because your word is living and active and powerful and still accomplishing what you want it to today. In Jesus' name, amen.